That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about A Jazz Man's Blues, which I believe is the 23rd film directed by Tyler Peary, which uh, premiered at the 2022 Toronto International Film Festival uh, and was released in a limited theatrical engagement by Netflix September 16th, 2022, a week before it will be streaming on its service September 23rd. That made me think of, um, he's just mad because he got married. <laughs> but Jack um, A., there's this, I'll put a picture of it, but there's this guy on YouTube who made a video doing like a parody of Jack A. Harry. It's actually pretty it's funny. It's really cute. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, where to begin? Hmm. Oh. I was. Tyler Perry, you know. Let's start with the positive. Because he's like a prolific filmmaker who's created his own studio. Yes. Has employed many people. And he does try to make movies. <laughs> it was refreshing to see that he is, is trying something a bit outside of his wheelhouse, i.e. another Medea film. Uh, w because I think that is ultimately where maybe his strengths... I don't know. I, 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 <laughs> okay, when I heard all the buzz about this movie was 27 years in the making and that it took him this long... I was 100% sure this movie was going to feature, like, a gay character, like someone coming out of the closet. And I thought for sure that was going to coincide with Tyler Perry coming out of the closet. Much like the expectation we had of Queen Latifah when she did played Bessie Smith. And both are still not gay, I guess. But anyway, that's not what this movie is. <clears throat> and really, the 27 years is just that he wrote this story or began the seeds of this story 27 years ago. Although I'm not quite sure what took so long because he's had hundreds of millions of dollars for a long time. He's had a studio for several many years mm -hmm. now. So I don't know why now this movie had to happen, but it is, as all of his plots are, very busy. Mm -hmm. It's not as melodramatic as like a Medea movie is, but it definitely, his style of filmmaking does not serve this subject matter well. Um, yes, there, as in there's no respite. It's just the constant things, ha it's a soap opera. So I can't even say the basic story because it is very busy, but I suppose it revolves around a character named Bayou, mm -hmm. who's played by... Joshua Boone, who uh, is in Rashad Ernesto Green's Premature, which is a film I would recommend. So the story, his story starts in 1937, and we see that he lives in Georgia, like Jim Crow era South. He lives in, you know, segregated area, poverty. And within his little community, there's a lot going on. First of all, he lives with his father, mother, and brother. And the father, like, hates him. And keeps talking about him like he's so black. And his brother is much lighter skinned. Willie Earl. It's very confusing because the dad who hates Bayou, this dark skinned black man, is just as dark as Bayou. So I'm confused. I mean, it's self hating, but the, the, the way it's played out, I'm not clear if that dad is his biological father. Because it would make more sense that the dad is the father of Bayou and not Willie Earl. Right. Uh, the, the, the vitriol is such that it leads you to question what we're being presented with. Right. Okay, so that's happening to poor Bayou. He meets a girl in town who's called Bucket <laughs> because she is well, like was abandoned by her family. But her actual name is Leanne. Mm -hmm. Leanne Jean Harper, played by Soleil Pfeiffer in her uh, debut. Oh, beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. She can pass for white. But she's not doing that in this town she lives in. Like, everyone knows she's black and she lives with other black people. But her mother, Leanne's mother, who also can pass for white, they were abandoned by the dad slash husband. So the mom has this idea that she wants to have her daughter marry a white man. All of a sudden. All of a sudden. So he can take care of them. Because Leanne's not even living with her mother. She's living with her grandfather in this poor little village town who's actually raping her, which is something else we can talk about. But all of a sudden, Leanne gets scooped away by her mother and poor Bayou is left hanging because he's in love with her. When We'll get into this supposed love affair. Mm -hmm. But Bayou moves on, goes into the military. While he's in the military, Bayou's mom, because the dad ends up leaving with his light-skinned brother, the mom ends up moving to a different part of the state, not too, too far away, starts her own juke joint. She's successful. Bayou gets injured in like active duty and returns home, his new home, with 
his mother. And one day while he's out uh, visiting another lady who he grew up with, Sitsi. Sitsi. He is at this like rich white man's house where Sitsi works as like a maid. The sheriff. It's not the sheriff's house. It's that they inherited. The sheriff, that house that Sitsi works in is not the sheriff's house. Right. But, but yes, he's there. And all of a sudden in walks Leanne with her white husband. That's their house. Mm-hmm. Who's the brother to the sheriff? Who's Sorry. the brother to the sheriff? And it's Leanne's husband who inherited the house. So of course, Sitsi and Bayou are like WTF on the inside, but they don't show it to the white folks. And Leanne is playing along like, yeah, I'm a white lady. I don't know y'all. But of course, she's confronted by Sitsi and Bayou. And then Bayou and Leanne rekindle their love affair, mm-hmm. which of course now it's 1947 in Georgia. Like, they're going to get killed. So it's a dangerous game they're playing, although the film doesn't offer us the tension we need, which is a crime we can get into because inherently there's some tension that with this subject matter that somehow Tyler Perry has sucked out of this movie. Yeah. But anyway, they're playing with fire to the point where Bayou is about to get lynched. So he runs out of town and goes up to Chicago. And then we start a different movie where Bayou is in Chicago and basically turns into like Cab Calloway. Mm -hmm. He becomes like a successful jazz singer with his brother, the light-skinned guy who hates him. And hates him, never stops hating him, which is integral to the plot because... Very uh, Cain and Abel, yeah. Because now that Bayou is like a successful jazz singer living in the North where he has more safety... One day he decides to go back down to Georgia to the same town where he was almost lynched to visit his mother. Because he's been alerted that her business is in trouble. So he goes down there and decides to bring his brother with him who hates him. And, and there's, they have an altercation where the brother is like, I'm going to get you back. Like, I'm going to kill you. He tries to kill him. And Willie Earl is also addicted to And Willie Earl is addicted to drugs. Mm-hmm. They get back down to Georgia. And what's the first thing Willie Earl does when they get back down to town? He goes and finds the sheriff and says, oh, that guy you were trying to lynch, he's here. All these white men come with their torches and lynch, hang, by you. The end. But it, it's not really the end because the film opens... The film is bookended in 1987. In 1987 with this white racist-ass politician on TV talking about how affirmative action is welfare and clearly he has a Confederate flag hanging... The film opens with this old, old, old black lady going to his office and basically saying, I need you to investigate a murder and dumps a bunch of letters on his desk. And the letters are addressed to Leanne Harper. So in quick order, we realize that someone ends up dying. And as soon as we see Bayou interacting with this woman, this black woman who passes for white, who marries a white man, obviously it's... Bayou, who's going to be killed. So the next hour and a half of the movie, we're just waiting for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And then the end of the film is the entire movie we watched was supposed to be like this white politician reading the letters. Mm -hmm. So he goes home and his wife is like, geez, you've been gone all day. And he's like, yeah, I was reading or whatever. And he goes, and your mama's been here and she's been singing that song. And then we find out that that white politician, because we also, throughout... Towards the end of the movie, we find out that Leanne, the black lady who passes for white, she becomes pregnant. And obviously we think, well, it's either her white husband or black bayou. So she delivers this baby. The baby looks very white. But she, there's a point where she's concerned, like, is the baby getting darker? We find out that that politician's mom is Leanne. And basically he finds out through reading these letters that his father is this black man who his dad lynched basically Mm -hmm. and the clearly he's upset he goes outside sits on the porch in front of his confederate flag the end Mm -hmm. man i I have (sighs) so much to look can we start with what was good about the movie yeah i think for tyler perry not doing like a medea movie i feel like and 
him having written it because I think for Colored Girls is a better movie, but it's based on source material that he that he took great liberties with to many people's chagrin. But yeah. yes, and the busyness of that works because it's it's an ensemble vignette style where all these intersecting characters. I, I think that works well. It coalesces yeah. in a way that's satisfying. And then he casted it. You know, I mean, the cast is very impressive, yeah. right? Whoopi Goldberg. Felicia Rashad, Janet, of course, Janet Demita, Joe Loretta Jackson, Divine, yeah. Loretta Divine, Tendu. Tendu, I mean, you know, she looks crazy. Carrie but, Washington. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I feel like for him, this is better than what he normally does. So good for him. Yes, I, I had reservations about it, but I was very curious to see what this would be. The cinematography, I think, is good. Shot by Brett Pollock, who. Uh, often works with uh, Destin Daniel Cretton. He shot uh, Just Mercy starring Michael B. Jordan and The Glass Castle, for instance. I thought the acting from everyone was fine. Like, yeah. Yeah, like better than I would have expected. Um, so it's, there are some musical numbers in this movie. Not like it's a musical, but because uh, the mom has a juke joint and then Bayou is a jazz man at a club that caters to white folks, we do get a few musical numbers. And I thought the. The music was okay. We can talk about Bayou singing because that's important. But, but well, in uh, Debbie Allen choreographed. Yeah, so uh, I think that works well. And songs arranged and produced by Terrence Blanchard, an Oscar-nominated um, composer who uh, has done quite a lot of work with Spike Lee. But I would say, I was thinking, this movie took 27 years to make because Tyler Perry finally got his hair game down because I think everyone's hair looks nice. <clears throat> yes. Which is usually never the case in a Tyler Perry movie. Yes. So that's good. Yes. Attention to period detail was, I want. I don't want to say I'm point everywhere in this, but was certainly attenuated. Okay, I'm just going to go through my notes. So the opening's crunchy because we see this old lady walk into the politician's office and she's clearly with old lady makeup. I've seen worse. Yeah, but it's so obvious, like, oh, this is, this person, we're going to, like, we know that this person's going to exist in the flashback we get, so already that's spoiling something. Then she's like, investigate a murder. Okay. So you put two and two together, and within the first, like, 45 minutes of the film, we know, or the first half an hour of the film, we know who's probably going to get murdered. So I just thought that that seemed so unnecessary. Because it is. Uh, yes, and I think it's at the 45-minute mark, because we stopped it to check, is when it's like, oh, there's something kind of film noirish that's about to happen, whereas like these people feel like Leanne and her mother uh, might be plotting, or somebody's going to be plotting to kill uh, Bayou. There's so much about the story I found unsatisfying. First is Bayou's familial uh, relationship, because I didn't understand... So Bayou's mom is fair-skinned, and then the brother, Willie Earl, is similar complexion. The dad is dark skin, similar to Bayou. But then the way the dad is talking is like, I'm not your father and I hate your black ass. And it was just very extreme for almost like, I'm, I'm very confused on the dynamic of the family and why the dad hates the son so much. And then the dad gets drunk one day, takes all the money and leaves. And then doesn't even take the son who he says more than once he favors. Mm -hmm. And then the son sometime later says, I'm leaving. I'm going to go visit my dad because I want to be in Chicago. We never hear about the dad again. <laughs> no, which is fine. Which is fine, but I just thought like, uh, oh, oh, okay. But we get the sense, uh, it, it's trying to do some things like maybe the uh, initial attraction to Leanne is also, she's been abandoned in a similar way by a parent. Well, that's my next note is the relationship between Leanne and Bayou feels very... For this romance where they're like Bayou's willing to risk everything because when he's reintroduced to her some years later, now that she's married to a white man, it seems like initially he's like, girl, leave me alone because you know they're going to kill us if we find us together. But then immediately he's like madly in love with her and wants to be with her. But then the opening where we get the development of their relationship, it's really just him sort of because she's beautiful. So he's attracted to her and then she teaches him how to read, mm -hmm. which reminded me of where the crawdads sing. Oh, yeah. It or... kind of felt like that. Like, where's the actual like romance? And it's just like this lady taught you how to read. And then we get a couple scenes of you two being like in close physical proximity. Like peas and carrots. And then. Like Forrest Gump. Yeah, and then because Leanne lives with her mean old grandfather. Then, before we even fully understand that they're madly in love, Bayou witnesses Leanne being raped by her grandfather. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after that, 
Leanne is taken by her mother to to eventually go marry some white men. It just happens like, I don't know, it's just like, I feel like that relationship, which is the core of this movie, should have been better developed. I agree, but uh, I think all of the characters are very one-dimensional, and yeah. I, I just don't think Tyler Perry has the storytelling. He's not a good storyteller. No. I, I think that uh, he should have outlined this and then allowed a, a different writer to flesh I think it out. because but, I don't think he's good at telling stories, so then all, that's why all of his screenplays are very busy. Yes. Because it's like, if I just do a bunch of shit something will connect to someone and there'll be a funny moment here. And, and it makes sense in the Medea movie, I guess. But in a film like this, because I'm going off track, but the, the crime of this film is that, and we actually made a list of a, of a bunch of movies that are set in similar environments, similar time period with similar themes that, are, that handle all of those much better. And I think the crime is inherently a film involving like interracial relationships and Jim Crow era South and the racism. And passing. And the racism and passing and, and the violence against black people. All of these themes uh, hit very hard. Like, it, like just inherently they invoke emotion. And somehow Tyler Perry removed that emotion. <laughs> Some, any, any of the movies you're about to talk about leave me like upset and angry and frustrated and bring tears to my eyes and somehow in this movie for two and a half hours I didn't really feel much right and it especially seems egregious because most of the examples of film we have of like black people in the 1930s, 1930s and 40s are almost always having to interact with white people and there's a focus pulled away from them a lot too so it's like this this you know was uh, primed to be just you know a black film uh, focusing yeah. specifically on on these experiences but it, you know something like Mudbound came to mind or the story of a three-day pass Melvin Van Peebles um, debut but really this feel this felt like um, Tyler Perry trying to do a version of ragtime um, or be, mixed with something like imitation of life mm -hmm. or Alex Haley's Queen um, and, passing yeah passing uh, which the danger you feel for the for Ruth Nega and that is is much higher, but but also like the pity you feel uh, for like Freddie Washington, the original 1934 version of Imitation of Life, like is so potent, and and that uh, Freddie Washington uh, is a really interesting uh, case study because she was an actual woman of color who is allowed to be in this film and whose career obviously couldn't flourish in Hollywood. When other movies from that period like Gene Crane and Pinky, like they just they you know actually put white people in those roles. But uh, yeah, there's so many interesting things that that could have pulled focus. And then it does this thing where it's like doing that Theodore Dreiser, Sister Carrie, where, as you referenced Cab Calloway, there, there's a tradition of um, black film in the 30s and 40s where you have like Cabin in the Sky with Ethel Waters and uh, Stormy Weather with Lena Horne and a whole bunch of other people in both those movies, about, but these kind of black musicals uh, that really uh, enhance the careers uh, to a certain degree for some of those performers, but that just feels tacked on us unnecessarily. Oh, I just feel like I'm just, all, all, all these notes are me complaining. Uh, <laughs> well, let's talk about um, the uh, singing of Bayou. Okay, so what, Willie we, Earl is the musician. Like, mm -hmm. he's the one who wants to go to Chicago and sing. We're not even really introduced to the fact that Bayou can sing until he goes to visit his mom's juke joint after he leaves the armed services. And then she's like, sing a little something, and he sings, and he can sing. But there is a character we didn't mention, uh, this white, or this German-Jewish white guy. Ira, played by Ira, Ryan Eggold. Who Willie Earl connects with at a bar, or like at his mom's juke joint, and he helps he says he'll help willie earl get a career in chicago and he does like this guy ira is an honest guy but he recognizes he thinks that the bigger draw would be bayou but he still proceeds with willie earl however at the point when willie when bayou is about to be lynched and he runs away bayou actually runs away with ira and willie earl so they all go to Chicago, and then they get booked at this like white jazz club, the Capitol Royal, the Royale. Capitol Royale, and for some reason everyone prefers Bayou over Willie Earl. And I was so confused because I think for this sort of club, I think Willie Earl would have been a better fit because he's fair skinned, but also Willie Earl is much more charismatic. Like he would get my attention when we see Bayou perform, which is like what four times, it it, it couldn't have been more flat. 
It's pretty lackluster. Uh, the, it, as in, there's nothing wrong with his singing or his performance. It's just like the energy is just real low. It's kept at a simmer. Yeah, it's and, so strange that they wouldn't have him be like a star. And I think something else really telling about that is he introduces this other performer in doing some like sexy Brazilian dance they introduce it as. And then Tyler Perry uses that to do this thing that he did in For Colored Girls where he juxtaposes the, um, like he interweaves that with the birth of uh Leanne is Leanne's going baby. into labor and while that's happening, we see this like jo Josephine Baker type character performing, which is very similar to... Anna Canoni Rose being raped while Janet's at the opera. At the opera and, and for Colored Girls. Yeah. yeah, so that felt sort of, you know, recycled. Okay, um, I guess I just keep going back to how... I wanted to say what I wanted this movie to be until the end, but I'll do it now. I think this story should have been told from the perspective of Leanne. Mm -hmm. This black woman who passes as a white woman and she marries this white man. And like the inherent sort of terror of like being found out. And what I thought would have been a better story is we can start the same way where this black woman living in the South, you know, who passes for white, her mom marries her off to some white man like in Boston. And so they move up there, no one knows, and she lives happily ever after, except that white man inherits, inherits his father's home back in Georgia. Because in this movie, that house they live in uh, is the result of that white guy's dad dying. So that could have been the same, except now this black lady has to move back down to where she's from. And now the entire film is like, is she going to get caught? People are going to recognize her. Of course, she's going to interact with a previous love. I think, like you said, this could have just focused on... It could have been much smaller and more intimate and so much more effective. Mm -hmm. But instead, there is so much happening. It plays with all the obvious cues. And then even, even seeing like this racist-ass sheriff who... I mean, what they're saying is like, they hate black people and they kill black people and they're like... They're saying the words, but I never quite felt in fear. And then they're not as vile as they should be. Because even when the husband and his brother, the sheriff, are looking for Bayou, they end up going to Bayou's mom's house, whose name is Hattie, Hattie May. Played mm -hmm. by uh, and I feel like Amra in, Van. And I feel like Amra in Van. any other movie based in this environment, they would have burned that lady's house down, if not killed her. But in this movie, they're just like, no... Okay, we'll go somewhere else. Because she said, Hattie Mae, who has a juke joint, is paying off the sheriff. So he like lets her keep her club open. So that sort of explains why he doesn't burn her house down. But it just seems very like tame. Mm -hmm. So it's just taking a lot of the fear and terror. And then the IMD description for this film is saying that it's like a thriller, like trying to investigate a murder, like, like a thrilling tale of a murder investigation. This film is not that at all. No, something that actually does, that description fits uh, more accurately is uh, In the Electric Mist starring Tommy Lee Jones, which was a French director, Bertrand Tavernier. Uh, we do get one sex scene where Bayou and Leanne are having sex in her car and Leanne's mom catches them. And she thinks that she knows that if the husband finds out, she'll, he'll kill everyone. Mm -hmm. So she tells on Bayou. I just thought, like, that scene, I think, made... Like, that was kind of the tone I was looking for. Is the fear and the... Yeah, just the terror of, like, the situation they've gotten themselves into. But they're sort of, like, pushed into a corner. Right. And, I, you know, you didn't see Passing, which is also on Netflix. I highly, highly recommend. That was uh, my number two film last year. But I wanted it to, I wanted to have more of that feeling or, or something like we saw a recently uh, staged production of Blues for an Alabama Sky. Yes. Which Felicia Rashad uh, directed. And I, I, I wanted that energy from the character. Another sort of dynamic or scene that worked really well is Sitsi, the young lady who... Sitsi Fibrosis. <laughs> The young lady who uh, Bayou and Leanne grew up with, uh, she is now Leanne's maid. Mm -hmm. And there's a scene where Leanne is mad at her because she thinks she's like having an affair with um, Bayou. And she like slaps her and forces her to like clean. In her best and I, dress. And I thought that was also an effective scene. Like that should have been the energy of like the internal conflict of this black woman who's passing for white and she knows she doesn't feel right about this. Like it's made clear that her character doesn't 
want to live this life, but she's also being very reckless. That's another feeling I have overall of this, of this film. I didn't like the main characters. I feel like Leanne was being selfish and, and, and didn't like, wasn't thinking that she's putting this person who she thinks she loves in jeopardy. I think Bayou is very frustrating because he's making these stupid choices. The mom, Hattie Mae, is like, she, she's not very helpful. She's not helpful. Like, her husband was so vile to her son, but then she's trying to protect... Like, that was weird. I just think the only characters who didn't bother me were Sitsy. Mm -hmm. Who's played by Milwana Jackson. I thought she I feel like that characterization made sense. Mm -hmm. And then maybe Ira, even though I thought his character was corny. Yeah, I know you have a note about his little monologue. Which... Whose monologue? Ira's. Which monologue? To... Uh, when he he uh, runs away with Bayou, who goes and throws up in the field the next morning, and then he has his he has his little monologue. Oh my about gosh! Him. Yes. So when Bayou leaves, like to escape the lynching, and he's with Ira, they drive all night to make it to Chicago, and Bayou wants to go back. He he leaves, and then they have this talk, and Ira's basically explaining like how he's like a Jewish person who was living in Germany and all the things he dealt with, trying to sort of compare like his plight and how he understands the black man's plight in 1940, whatever. And then Bayou tells him, this don't make me feel no better. And I laughed because it's just like, okay, it was just such an obvious, like, mm -hmm. it just felt so heavy handed. It, it was, it was. But, uh, Buckets with... <laughs> Who she did not want to be called Bucket, uh, which I guess is a very cruel nickname. We only have three minutes left, but <laughs> oh, um, I, Ryan, you, you mentioned something that I thought was funny. As you said, Tyler Perry's imaginary letter writing is not good because we do get several scenes where someone's writing, like reading a letter. Mm -hmm. So if Tyler Perry's the writer, I guess he wrote those letters, and they're lots, not the best. Lots of repeated statements. Yeah, right? it's very remedial. Uh, but no, her name reminded me of Ruby's Bucket of Blood, starring Angela Bassett. Um, Willie. Uh, Bayou's brother, who becomes addicted to drugs while they're performing at this uh, jazz club, he was a very frustrating character. It just seemed like that could have been its own movie. Yes. It, again, it's like three different things kind of sparring for attention, uh, but all of them are too one-dimensional to really count. But This I, is... Oh, go ahead. There, but there, sorry, there are... I think there are interesting things about the story. It's just I, I wish... The, you know... I kind of am frustrated with this film in the way I was frustrated with the United States against Billie Holiday. Yeah, which uh, felt like a television film. Yeah, just like it's so overly... Oh, yeah, and the, uh, kind of the lack of reaction you have to seeing a black man lynched. That's another... I would be very curious to know how people feel about... It. There is a scene, like when Bayou is lynched, he's hung from a tree and we see him hanging from the tree. We hear him being shot and then hung from the tree. And I just thought that it just... I don't know. It, it didn't sit right with me for some reason. It just didn't feel like this film doesn't deserve use of that imagery kind of like, mm -hmm. because it's not taking everything else seriously enough. Like, right. Uh, yeah. It, the, the terror and the, like the despair, I think you should, uh, should be invoked by seeing those images. It, like I always go back to the opening of Mississippi burning, which terrified me, you know, granted I was a kid myself, sure. but, but that, that feeling in your gut, like, Oh, this is a, this is a cruel, terrible world. Yeah, and I just didn't. F yeah, I would. I would be so curious to know what people think about this film. I just, I just don't like Tyler Perry. Really sucked a lot of the emotion out of uh, stories that are inherently upsetting. Especially <laughs> because also, even that as its title would indicate, I, I don't. I'm, I imagine he's aware of Al Jolson and uh, the jazz singer, who was Al Jolson was the king of blackface, but also was this white performer. Uh, who brought black music to the white masses because they wouldn't listen to uh, black people singing it and kind mm -hmm. of that, that terrible history there. And, and this is a, as a, a process of kind of recuperating. We have to that. end the video. What would you give this movie? I, 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 it's a, I don't think the movie is like I've poorly, much, poorly put together. I just think it's really ineffective storytelling. I've seen much worse, but that doesn't mean it's good. Yeah. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye.